Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, is a treatment option available for mental illness sufferers where small electric currents are directed towards specific regions of a patient's brain. A patient is given general anesthesia and muscle relaxants to reduce the body spasms from an artificially induced seizure. But how does it work? And isn't it a pseudoscience? Is it even safe? I have some answers, I have some memes, and I have some facts, but I hope you walk away with as many of each as possible. Follow me. Thunder! Yeah! Are you feeling depressed? Have you sought solutions to your mental illnesses that just didn't do the job? I'm Shocky V. Zappington, here to introduce to you an easy, sleepy experience meant to send your demons running for the hills. Utilizing top-of-the-line electricity, only the safest currents will take a tour through your brain. Once you are given a general anesthesia, your 10 minutes of slight seizure induction will begin. After about 20 visits with your carefully selected specialist and their professional medical team, there's a good chance you'll be feeling right as rain. Gone are the days of Frankenstein. Here are the days of you. Please do not operate a vehicle within 24 hours of having electroconvulsive therapy. Mild temporary memory loss may occur. Please consult your doctor, family, friends, and animals before taking a step towards ECT. ECT should be attempted as a last resort. Subscribe to Actually Antag. Results may vary. Electroconvulsed Shocky V Zappington, I haven't seen you since like my fourth upload. Where on earth have you been? Animal. How do you like these flashes? <laughs> How do you like them? Please. <laughs> You're an animal. That's all you're good for! Prod the cattle! That's a story for another time. I'm gonna go talk to somebody. To kick things off, let's recap a bit of history. The year was 1770 in the United States of America. The public hospital of Virginia had just opened up to give a home to, study, and care for those with disabilities that affected their mental and overall development. This was the first hospital built in the United States with the purpose of caring for the mentally handicapped. Today, there are over 500 psychiatric institutions on American soil. Before the mid-1900s, asylum workers had taken note that a patient's mental state often improved after an epileptic seizure subsided. In the 1930s, a Portuguese psychiatrist named Ladislas Maduna concluded that a stimulant called metrazole, when given in high enough doses, could give the patient seizures. This was done to reduce the severity of mental illnesses. This is where the term convulsive therapy comes from. The problem with relying on seizures to ease a patient's mind is that the fracturing of bones is a common occurrence, and the use of metrazole pre-seizure wasn't anything short of a nightmare for the patients to experience either. In the late 1930s, Italian neurologist Hugo Cerletti began experimenting on live animals with electricity. A shock was delivered to the animal's head, causing it to enter a state similar to when one is given anesthesia. He presumed that perhaps if a human was given a mild shock before a seizure was induced, muscle spasms and body jerking could be minimalized, therefore reducing physical damage to the patient. Testing ECT on humans first began in 1938, which yielded positive results. Hugo Sir Letty was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Medicine, and by the 1940s, more and more facilities began adopting the practice of electroconvulsive therapy to help those who suffer from complicated mental illnesses. By the 1950s, ECT had become less popular due to the introduction of newer drugs that achieved similar results. The anti-psychiatry movement followed in the 1960s, and ECT didn't make a serious comeback until the 1980s. 
During the anti-psychiatry movement, public outrage threw the ethics of institutions into question, and as a result, the psychiatric world took a toll. Institutions were overcrowded, workers were underpaid, overworked, and mistreatment of patients was prevalent, which included sexual and physical abuse. Today, electroconvulsive therapy research is ongoing, and the practice is far from abandoned. But how does it all work? What's really going on when someone receives ECT? Do they just strap you down to a wooden table while you squirm around and your hair gets frizzy? Kind of. But we're going to have to get a little more specific. It's highly recommended that you only consider ECT as a last resort, meaning you've had a go with a multitude of other potential solutions first. In most cases, the first thing experts recommend that you do is to consult with loved ones, and usually you'll need a referral from a primary psychiatrist. You'll most likely be given a checkup first. An IV will be stuck in your arm and you will be given a general anesthesia as well as muscle relaxants. Pressure cuffs will be equipped to deny the medication access to certain parts of your body, such as your feet. It's also not uncommon to be given an oxygen mask or mouth guard. An electrode pad, or more than one depending on your procedure, will be placed on your head with the intention of focusing electrical currents onto target regions of your brain. While you sleep, you won't feel any discomfort caused by the ECT, and neither will your wallet. The University of Chicago's Department of Psychiatry remarks that ECT is usually covered by insurance providers, however, they usually have an ECT center that they prefer you use. Are you in good hands? If the ECT isn't covered by your insurance, you can expect to pay anywhere from $300 to $1,000 per visit. Patients usually return around 10 times a year to keep their mental illnesses at bay, as well as taking medication and receiving further psychiatric care for their condition. Generally, the only type of people who need this therapy are hardcore sufferers of depression, schizophrenics, and those with dementia. Once you are asleep and the seizure begins, it typically won't last longer than a minute. You won't be able to recall the session, and additional temporary memory loss can happen. Although ECT isn't entirely understood, it is known that seizures can change the chemical aspects of our brain. It's believed that the sudden change can cause somewhat of a chain reaction. In turn, there's a decent chance that the switch up will have you feeling at least a little differently, but preferably better. Once the therapy concludes, it is intensely frowned upon to drive within 24 hours, and you will most certainly be asked to have a loved one pick you up. Some estimates place the number of ECT treatments received each year at around a million, but hopefully as the years go on, research will be able to conclusively say for certain the full effects and capabilities regarding this controversial topic. An associate of Harvard Medical School, McLean Hospital, may currently be the leader in this field of study. In addition, their services provide over 7,000 ECT treatments every year. There are other well-qualified believers, such as Claudia Chavez, MD, who is an associate professor of neurology at the Tufts Medical School in Massachusetts. She is board certified in neurology and is co-director of neurology at the Leahy Hospital and Medical Center in Massachusetts. My guess is she probably knows what she's talking about. Don't touch me, I'm sterile! As well as Chris Abbott, MD, the medical director of the ECT program for the University of New Mexico. He has observed that people given electroconvulsive therapy experience growth in certain regions of the brain, including the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory. Time will be the biggest player of this electric game as our understanding of electroconvulsive therapy develops. And also worth noting, researchers in ECT seem to notice that consumer-led research reports yield far more negative results than reports by health professionals. Some negative side effects can still happen, and in rare cases can be fatal. Fractured bones can still occur. Memory loss experience can be worse for one person than another. You might start developing headaches, and in extreme cases, the depression being treated only seem to get worse. This can be a risky solution, and it's not for everybody. There's a reason this option for treatment is meant to be taken very seriously, but it should be up to the consumer and their psychiatric care. It's about balancing up the risks with the possibility of a brighter day, to finally not feel hopeless. Do you have the right to take that away from someone? Just something to think about. 
Know that the most powerful tool for learning is interest. Let me know what piques your curiosity. Maybe I'll make a video about it. See you next week.